Yeah, All right, good evening. Um, so folks in Zoom land, please make sure you are muted. We can hear some of y'all talking. Um, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for being here in person and on Zoom here uh, this evening on the Ides of March. Um, Thank you so much to the Kenworthy for being such an awesome venue. We really love being able to do a hybrid setup like this. Um, let's see, we've got major funding for this event provided by the Idaho Humanities Council. So we're very thankful for them um, to support us with this event. Uh, we also have our friends from the Latak County Human Rights Task Force here. If you missed it in the lobby, they have some of the art from their MLK art contest. Please uh, be sure to see that on the way out. Also, the Kenworthy, they've got their concessions available. So if you get thirsty or want some popcorn, feel free to get up and uh, enjoy some of that. And uh, this program is part of our Queer History Project, which again is funded by the Idaho Humanities Council. So look for another event coming up in May or June. We're still in the planning for that. Partners from Inland Oasis. So stay tuned for future uh, programming brought to you. A uh, couple rules before we begin. Please, um, we wanna make sure we're all respectful please um, be mindful of your comments and your questions. Uh, we wanna make sure that this is a safe space. And um, so please just be mindful of that. Uh, tonight, we have my good friend, Alicia Grafe here. She is uh, in Boise right now, but we are very thankful she could present virtually for us today. Um, she, Alicia Grafe, is a historian and archivist living in Boise. Grafe received her master's degree from Boise State in 2018 with her thesis titled American Hatred, Wild West Myths, Color-Coded Rhetoric, and the Shaping of the Aryan Nations. Since then, she has received her MLIS, a library science degree from San Jose State University, and has worked at the Idaho State Archives and currently works at the Boise State University Special Collection and Archives. She also works as the official archivist and pod fort director for the Tree Fort Music Fest. So we are very happy to have her. We are happy to have all of you with us tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, I will turn it over to Alicia. Hi, thank you so much. Um, just wanna double check everyone can hear me uh, in the theater and, and on Zoom land. <laughs> Uh, this is the first time I've ever done a hybrid event like this, so thank you all so much for being here and for uh, the Latah County Historical Society for having me and being so flexible. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, and I, I'm just really thankful that um, Haley and the Latah County Historical Society were able to work with me for this, and I'm glad that we can have so many participants in both venues. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I know this topic isn't pleasant, but I'm so glad that we can all be here to talk and learn together. Um, I want to give a little warning, or yeah, a little warning first that the information and imagery I will be sharing throughout my presentation comes from archives around the state of Idaho, including, including the University of Idaho, Idaho State University, North Idaho College, Boise State University in the city of Boise, so I want to thank them. And as a warning, some of the materials used have imagery and language that have content that is explicit and racist and might be really hard to view, but um, we're going to view it together. So uh, I want to start this discussion off by saying that I am presenting this from a place of love. I am a born and raised fourth generation Idahoan. My family has been here for generations and very few of us have left the state. I've wrestled with staying in the state of, for years now just because of the increase in far right activity and not just activity, but the legislature making it harder and harder for myself, a queer person to live comfortably in my own state. My goal in my research has only been to trace the history and trajectory of hate groups in Idaho 
as a way to understand how we got here. Here being swastikas on the Anne Frank Memorial in Boise, the only one of its kind, and arrests of 31 Patriot front men in Coeur d'Alene during a pride parade. We can't discuss how to move forward without knowing what has happened, without understanding and discussing our own history, no matter how painful it is. We have to look this ugly past and present in the eyes, name it and document it. To be transparent, I am a historian and an archivist, so to me, I value collecting, documenting, and tracking history, even if it is of hate groups. Knowing their rhetoric, their beliefs, and their tactics are all important aspects of fighting against current hate groups in the area. At the time of writing my thesis in 2018, Donald Trump was still in office and white supremacy was a huge topic nationally. I, like I'm sure many other Americans hope to believe that the rise of white supremacy and fascism we saw nationally would die down after Trump left office, but that has been far from the truth. What we did see happen was a further radicalization of Republicans, which changed the landscape of politics and the two party system entirely. A continuing rise of white supremacy groups and a radical shift in politics leading to the passage of harmful legislation nationally and statewide. Back in 2018, when I developed my thesis, I was so motivated in talking about this history because I saw all of Richard Butler and the Aryan Nation's plans reflected in the alt-right movement that was happening at the time. And unfortunately, it has only gotten worse and more prevalent. So this presentation is a brief history of hate groups in Idaho revolving around the Aryan Nations and their ongoing legacy ending with a discussion on the current political landscape of Idaho. I will focus on white separatists and anti-federal government militias, which are the most prevalent groups in our state. White separatists specifically believe in separating off from the rest of society and establishing their own government. These groups are often anti-federal government, but have deep racist roots. They have started small in rural towns in Idaho, but they have been influential in state and local elections, pushing the in-control Republican Party more right-wing year by year, resulting in attacks on libraries and library funding, transgender Idahoans, including gender-affirming healthcare, drag queens and public performances, mask mandates and the right to vaccinations, abortion rights, healthcare access, and much, much more. The current hate groups in Idaho have done a substantial amount of work to make this vision happen. The same vision that Richard Butler presented here on the left had when he built his compound in Hayden Lake, Idaho in 1973. Uh, I will also be talking about the order, their little logo, they're really hard to find photographs of, their logo is in the middle. And then Louis Beam was the grand dragon of the Texas KKK, who I will also be talking about. So this vision that Richard Butler had and this tie with legislature can really be seen by the election of the former Idaho Lieutenant Governor Janice McEachin. She was an out outwardly right, far right Republican endorsed by Donald Trump with ties to white supremacy and militia groups. She's pictured here with white nationalist Vincent James Fox, a former Californian present during the January 6th riot. Uh, he was banned from most social media platforms, but in a video, Fox openly said, quote, we are going to take over the state. We have a large group of people and that group is growing. A true actual right wing takeover is happening right now in the state of Idaho, and there's nothing these people can do about it. So if you're a legislature here, either get in line or get out of the way, unquote. And many legislatures have gotten in line. Fox explained in this video that the solution is local politics, getting elected locally, including school, school boards and county commissions, and then unifying when it is time with other white separatist groups across the country. Fox shares the same vision Richard Butler did when he created his Aryan Nations compound in the 1970s. So on the right here is the compound built by Richard Butler. Butler was born in Colorado in 1918, but grew up in Los Angeles during the Depression. He studied aeronautical engineering science at City College and served in the Army Air Corps during World War II. 
While Butler never left America during the war, he taught aircraft hydraulics in the U.S. He later reflected on that time and was quoted as saying he believed he fought on the wrong side of the war. He expressed sympathy for Nazi Germany and began studying his own ancestry, believing that America was wrong to be fighting their own Aryan brethren in Europe. Butler started his journey during a time in America of great social upheaval. Black, sol black soldiers came home after the war demanding the same treatment as their white counterparts, including access to the GI Bill, free college tuition, and of course, desegregation and integration. Butler's city of Los Angeles became more and more diverse in front of his eyes. He began attending anti-communist meetings in the early 1950s where he first heard about the conspiracy theory that Jews controlled the American federal government and the United Nations. He also met William Potter Gale, who introduced him to posse comitatus, or power of the country. I know I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry, it's Latin. Um, and the religion of Christian identity. Uh, well, William P. Gale wrote Racial and National Identity, which was a book that's really popular in these circles. Um, and there's a photograph of him on the right. Uh, he began attending a Christian identity church in 1961 that was led by Revely, Reverend Wesley Swift. Butler and Swift bonded over the conspiracy inspired Nazi propaganda heard through World War II, that America was witnessing a government controlled by the Zionist occupational government or Zog, which would result in the Aryan race's demise. This was only fueled by the civil rights movement, the farm labor movement, the feminist movement, the Stonewall riots, and even the Watts riots in LA in 1965. Butler was experiencing the second great migration, which is shown on the map on the left. Uh, it was the movement of 5 million black Americans out of the South and into the North and the West. The second great migration sparked a white backlash as men and women like Butler watched their cities, and their neighborhoods changed before their eyes. After Swift's death, Butler started his own branch of Christian identity. He blended the religious beliefs with the Adolf Hitler-centric anti-Semitism conspiracy theory he had picked up in World War II. He continued his quest for truth even after anti-communist meetings declined and people began to move on to other political agendas in the 1970s. For Butler, America was too far gone, under control of Zog, and LA was too multicultural. So Butler and his wife began taking trips on their small private plane to northern Idaho, and by 1973, bought 20 acres in Hayden Lake. Butler created the Aryan Nations, building a compound to base his operation of the Christian Identity Church out of. By moving to Idaho and building his compound, he was following the new ideology put forward by Michigan-based KKK organizer, Robert Miles. Miles created something called the Northwest Imperative and he encouraged people to buy land in the Northwest. Miles said, quote, by white nationalists moving to the area, buying land together or adjacent to each other and having families consisting of five or 10 children, we will win the Northwest by outbreeding our opponents and keeping our children away from the insane and destructive values of the establishment." Unquote. Butler's compound, which he called a white bastion, would be the Western focal point of this white separatist slash Northwest imperative movement of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. This is where he encouraged his Aryan brothers and sisters to move to to separate from the government and create a pure Aryan American or a white ethno state. He encouraged people to buy land in Idaho and the surrounding states of Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Wyoming, just like Robert Miles had envisioned. To Butler, Idaho, specifically Northern Idaho, was the perfect haven for like-minded white separatists. Hayden Lake at the time only had a minority population of 1.69% in 1980, and Idaho as a whole was 95.2% white, and land was cheap. There was also already a presence of right-wing groups in Idaho, like the Posse Comitatus. 
They were de devoted to a citizen's government and aimed to defend their land and people with full force against the federal government. He also had the backing of survivalists in the area who subscribed to the belief that these small rural areas could easily be controlled and safe houses could be built for the impending race war. If you go back even further in Idaho's history, you'll find Confederate loyalists who moved to Idaho after the Civil War, as well as 12 to 13 Ku Klux Klan chapters beginning as early as 1922 in the state. The Klan even paraded through the streets of Boise to the fairgrounds and proudly took off their hoods, which at the time was unheard of, um, for photographs during the cross lighting, which is shown in this photograph. There's a legacy of groups of men moving to our state as a way to separate from the law and build a new society to fit their racist and white supremacist ideals. One of the largest groups Butler and the Aryan Nations targeted were anti-federal government groups and people. They even targeted men and women who had strong anti-government leanings, but were had no prior racist beliefs. Idaho has a long history of this, these anti-federal government opposition that is even stronger today. There are currently 13 active anti-government groups in Idaho. Because of our physical distance from Washington, D.C. and the rural openness of Idaho, many people are drawn to the state. Whether it be because of the strong Republican presence, many people, uh, the loose laws surrounding gun ownership, or the large population of white people, Idaho has become this almost lawless land or a haven for this ideology that quickly turns to racism. The Aryan nations attracted groups like the neo-Nazi gang, The Order, led by Robert Matthews, who led armed robberies and assassinated a Denver radio talk show host, Alan Berg, in 1984. It also attracted Randy and Vicki Weaver, survivalists who moved to Idaho to prepare for the end of the world and wanted to homeschool their children away from liberal ideology and multiculturalism. They visited the compound on multiple occasions, usually just for church service. They became martyrs for the far right movement after a standoff with the federal government on Ruby Ridge in 1992 that led to the death of three people including Randy Weaver's son and wife and a U.S. Marshal Service deputy. Butler and the Aryan Nations were in the front row of the police tape during the standoff and used the events to further prove that the federal government, who were controlled by Jews, that's their words, uh, were targeting them and would use any force necessary to get rid of them. The sentiments from the standoff rever reverberated throughout the country leading to heightened distrust of the government and heightened tensions that were felt at the Waco siege of 1993, which resulted in the deaths of 75 people, and the Oklahoma City bombing of 1995 that resulted in 168 deaths and 700 injuries. Men who were present at the Aryan World Congress meetings and the Ruby Ridge siege had been in attendance at both the Oklahoma City bombing and the Waco siege. In a newsletter to the Aryan Nation followers, Louis Beam, the KKK leader that you saw earlier, uh, who had, he had attended multiple Aryan World Congresses, warned Idaho, quote, the blood of these innocent ones, like a prism, makes everything clear. Someday without a signal from anyone, yet as if a signal had come from everyone, men will walk quickly out their front doors with a look of grim determination on their faces. It will happen nationwide. 10,000 Randy Weavers are spread out from one coast to another, unquote. Ruby Ridge had such an impact that right-wing leaders gathered in Estes Park, Colorado in 1992 to discuss their next course of action. They put together a special report that included Beam's plan for the leaderless re resistance a tactic among far-right organizations that is still used today. His plan was for these government, these organizations to split into smaller groups that acted on their own, like terrorist cells and creating chaos for the federal government, which is what many Aryan nations associated groups ended up doing through the 1990s and early 2000s, and is still something that's followed today. 
Ruby Ridge was such a pivotal moment in this far right movement. Many Idahoans sided with the Weavers and the Aryan Nations and were outraged about the federal government violence. Articles circulated for months after discussing the events and the trials held after. Idaho is such an isolated and quiet state that something so violent like that really shook up Idahoans. Many Idahoans doubled down on their belief in the right to be left alone, especially on their own land. And many were ready to defend it violently if necessary, which is exactly what the Aryan nations had been advocating for. Butler intended the Aryan Nations compound to be a training ground for this Aryan resistance, as well as an all white escape from the overrun America. Even before the federal government presence in Idaho, Butler hosted summer camp-esque events every year called the Aryan World Congress. He invited white supremacists, white separatists, Ku Klux Klan leaders, militias, and neo-Nazi skinheads to vacation. Here they attended church, held rallies in the streets of Coeur d'Alene, and practiced target shooting and resistance tactics. The children would attend workshops and classes where they learned to be good night riders while hearing KKK history from Pastor Robert Miles. They gave workshops on how to legally maneuver within the American legal system, how to mass market using printing presses and the internet, including early iterations of message boards. The Aryan Nations were actually the first hate group to use the internet in spreading their message, which was a tactic spearheaded by Louis Beam in the 1980s. In conjunction with the Aryan World Congresses, Butler would host a skinhead youth conference every April. In 1995, the compound hosted 250 to 400 members of the youth corps who would host a swastika lighting to end the weekend. While these groups all had different race, racist ideologies, they came together to share ideas, collaborate, and unify. Butler hoped that by inviting all of the white supremacy and white supremacy adjacent leaders to Hayden Lake, he could encourage them to join him in his specific white separatist vision. By all gathering in one place, it strengthened their camaraderie, their legitimacy, increased their numbers and made them feel like their small fringe groups weren't as isolated as they had thought. More and more people moved to Idaho who had similar beliefs to Butler, causing chaos in Idaho as well as the nation. As many residents of Coeur d'Alene, Moscow, and Idaho in general who lived through these times may attest, Butler wreaked havoc on Idaho's economy, national image, and sense of community. The Aryan Nations were responsible for a string of bombings in Coeur d'Alene in, in 1986. A pipe bomb exploded in Father Bill Wasmus' house, the leader of the Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations. Three weeks later, bombs exploded in front of the federal building in Coeur d'Alene and two business fronts, including an undetonated bomb on the roof of another office. Before the string of bombings, the congregation Ahaveth Israel Synagogue in Boise was bombed in 1984. Each time these violent acts were committed, the community of Idaho began to turn on the Aryan nations and began to stop ignoring them as crazy guys with guns in the mountains. The activities of the Aryan nations and the much more violent gang, the Order, the group discussed earlier, um, began to gain national attention just as human rights groups' activities increased. The Aryan Nations and the Order presence had branded Idaho as the hate state, which was making it difficult to attract new tourists or businesses. The Kootenai County Task Force on Human Relations formed in 1981 during the Aryan Nations most active period and helped raise money to fund educational and community driven programs to combat racism in Idaho. They, of course, were responsible for bankrupting, bankrupting the Aryan Nations alongside the Southern Poverty Law Center. After two Hayden Lake residents, Victoria Keenan and her son Jason, were shot at by Aryan Nations members after accidentally driving past their compound during the night. A court case was won and the process bankrupted Richard Butler and the compound was torn down. 
While this was the physical end to the Aryan Nations compound and the more violent offshoot groups started to abandon Butler and his mission, this was not the end of their legacy and irreparable damage done to Idaho. In 2010, the self-described national director of the Aryan Nations, Paul Mullet, told the Spokesman Review, quote, the Aryan Nations will never leave North Idaho, unquote. And he may have been right. Idaho dealt with the residual backlash for years after the compound was torn down. Just two years after the compound had been demolished on an episode of the popular television drama ER, an actor explains his hometown, but with with a caveat to one of the main characters saying, quote, I'm from Idaho, the potato part, part, not the white supremacist part, unquote. This was just a small example of how prevalent the new label the hate state was for the rest of the nation. The governor at the time, Dirk Kempthorne, told the Spokesman Review that, quote, the courage of a jury to bankrupt the Aryan nations and the work of local civil rights leaders should not be overlooked, unquote. While Idaho had physically pushed the Aryan nations out of the state, the reputation lingered. There was a time when governors and state legislatures would write back to concerned Idahoans about the state's reputation and their own safety, assuring them that this was not the Idaho way and the state was actively working towards eradicating this kind of behavior, as you can see in this letter from Cecil Andrus. Cecil Andrus responded to a different letter from someone being afraid of moving to Coeur d'Alene, saying, quote, if you move to Coeur d'Alene, your most serious complaint might well be the lack of time in which to enjoy the natural beauty and community activities that abound here, unquote. This has long been abandoned as far-right radicals have physically and metaphorically shaken hands with Idaho lawmakers recently. So in this next section, I will discuss the current far-right activity in Idaho as it relates to the Aryan Nations. One of the biggest and most recent pieces of Idaho news that circulated nationally was in 2022, when Patriot Front members were arrested in Coeur d'Alene at a Pride in the Park event. The 31 men were found hiding in the back of a U-Haul trailer and were arrested and charged with conspiracy to riot. The Patriot Front formed in 2017 after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where a man was found guilty of killing a woman and injuring others when he drove into the crowd of counter protesters. The Unite the Right rally where this group of men were formed echoes the main goal of Richard Butler, uniting like-minded individuals, acting against the federal government, and taking back America. Other recent events that made national news included the 2020 Black Lives Matter protesters clash with Blue Lives Matter and neo-Nazis in front of the city hall in downtown Boise. BLM supporters began the protest to call for the defunding of the police while a group called the Idaho Liberty Dogs led a counter protest. Many members of the Idaho Liberty Dogs had Nazi symbols on flags and tattooed on their bodies and BLM protests were protesters were followed to their cars and harassed by neo-Nazis. And in 2017 and 2020, the Idaho and Frank Memorial in downtown Boise was vandalized with Nazi propaganda. There were stickers with swastikas and anti-Semitic graffiti. One of the stickers left in 2020, 2020 read, we are everywhere which can be reflected in the three percenter badge that is shown on the left. That's also what they like to say. Um, and this really feels appropriate given the amount of far right extremist activities that have happened in Idaho as of late. Um, they, so uh, now I'm gonna list a few other people who have moved to Idaho recently. Um, David Riley, an anti-Semite who took part in the Charlottesville Unite the Right protest moved to Northern Idaho after the riot and was welcomed by a handful of Idaho Republicans. Um, he was present at a voting delegate, as a voting delegate at the GOP convention in 2022 and ran for school board in Post Falls and was backed by many Idaho Republicans. Herrick Palmgren from Sweden and Lana Lochtiff recently moved to Northern Idaho to run a popular white supremacist media organization called Red Ice, 
where they push the agenda that mixed race relationships are europhobic propaganda and compared them to a genocide as well. Uh, and they generally follow uh, general white supremacist conspiracy theories on their various channels. Former Lieutenant Governor Janice McEachin, who we've talked about before, um, posted a photograph on her Facebook page posing with an inmate who, who was serving 14 years for his role in a 2014 standoff against the federal government at a Nevada ranch called the Bundy Standoff. Um, not only was she showing support for the inmate, but she was flashing a symbol associated with the militia group the Three Percenters. This group is an anti-government group who adhere to the conspiracy theory that only 3% of American colonists fought against the British during the War of Independence, and they see themselves as a militia who are continuing this legacy and protecting Americans from government tyranny. <laughs> Janice McEachin also delivered a taped speech to the America First Political Action Conference in February of 2022, which was hosted by a Holocaust denier, Nick Fuentes. And another large anti-government group with a presence in Idaho is the Oath Keepers. They were formed in 2009 in Montana. And one of the members of this group includes Idaho State Representative Chad Christensen. He is no longer a representative because he lost his race in 2022 after the news came out. Um, members of this militia have served jail time for a variety of, of activities, including the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, which six Idaho residents have been charged for attending. There is also a large group of people taking up the Butler plan or this Northwest imperative that we talked about before, um, which had kind of fallen to the wayside after the Aryan Nations compound was taken down. Um, but these people are part of the greater Idaho movement. This movement seeks to add tens of thousands of square miles of rural Eastern Oregon into Idaho. While some people see this as a means for gaining more land and natural resources for Idaho, um, others support the movement as because they wanna add more conservative Republican voting counties to Idaho. Many conservatives in rural Eastern Oregon actually see themselves as refugees of liberal Oregon, but it, it also just echoes this long racist past of the Northwest imperative and a great white bastion since some supporters of the re resolution support the movement as a way to quote, maintain more traditional values, preserving a certain way of life and being properly represented by the state's lawmakers, which typically means the, the way of life being a white way of life. As of last week, the House passed a bill calling for conversations on the topic and it is headed to the Senate as we speak. Ammon Bundy has also become a vocal resident of Idaho recently. And if you live in Idaho, I'm sure you've seen his, um, his logos, you've seen him everywhere. Um, Bundy is an anti-government militant who created the Far Right People's Rights Network and ran for governor of Idaho in 2021, and he placed third in the election. Before moving to Idaho, he participated in the government standoff in 2014 with his father, Cliven Bundy, in Nevada. And, and then he led an armed occupation of a national wildlife refuge in Oregon in 2016. Bundy now lives in Emmett and has actively protested the stay at home orders during the coronavirus pandemic, mask mandates, and has been arrested for trespassing at the state capitol and the Idaho courthouse. As recently as March 6th, Idaho has continued to make it harder for the state to separate itself from, white hate, from hate groups. As the Idaho Senate cleared a bill that would repeal the long standing state law which prohibits private militias. The current state law forbids people, groups of people to associate themselves together as a military company or organi organization or parade in public with firearms. These types of laws have been really important in persecuting white supremacist rallies in other states like the Unite the Right rally. This repeal would further protect these kinds of gatherings and parades like the Aryan nations used to have, including 
full protection to bear arms during these gatherings. So to wrap this up, when I wrote my thesis, I wasn't particularly focused on the question of what can we do as Idahoans? I saw my role as a historian to present the facts, present my thesis and the history of extremism in Idaho as it related to the alt-right. I saw men like alt-right leader Richard Spencer, shown on the left, and the Proud Boys, shown on the right, as being exact replicas of Richard Butler and the Aryan Nations. And I wanted to draw parallels to help understand the movement at the time. These groups and individuals I discussed know of this white supremacist legacy among their circle, and they come to Idaho to continue Butler's vision. I saw the Aryan Nations as being extremely influential in the far right movement, but I didn't know what to do about it. And honestly, I still don't know what to do about it, especially as these activities continue to happen in Idaho and our Republican lawmakers are becoming more and more right wing and are literally and figuratively shaking hands with white supremacists and conspiracy theorists in the public. What I do know is that we can't ignore it and it is always overwhelming and it feels like too much, but we have to be paying attention and showing up when we can. Knowing who is running for your local school board, city council, or any local office can be a huge step. Uh, keeping just one right wing extremist off a of city council can save a city. This has happened before, but never on the scale, and I don't think we can downplay it. Bill Moreland, who was a journalist for the Spokesman Review, who heavily covered the neo Nazis and white supremacists in Idaho in an interview with C-SPAN said that many Idahoans were nervous to give an opinion about the Aryan Nations at the time. Many residents he encountered had the opinion that as long as they leave me alone, I'll leave them alone. And as I've discussed, they aren't keeping quiet and they aren't leaving anyone alone in the state of Idaho. Idaho is yet again leading the country in population growth with a majority arriving from the suburbs of California cities. In a survey conducted by Boise State University, 19.1% of newcomers to Idaho identified as very conservative on the survey, which compared to 16.2% of native Idahoans. And as KTVB found, Idaho saw 52,000 more Democrats registering to vote in recent years, while Republicans had seen 200,000 register to vote within the same year. And as patterns have shown, new Republicans from out of state vote more right wing candidates. So Richard Butler was not the only Californian to flee for Idaho. In 1993 alone, 11,000 people fled California for Idaho after LA erupted from the Rodney King verdict. There were so many U-Hauls that they had to pay people to drive trucks back to California. And so the highway connecting California to Idaho is often referred to as the white flight highway and continues to serve this purpose. Between 2017 and 2018, 21,000 people had moved to Idaho from California. So the last thing I will leave us with before questions is, uh, I want us to all remember Idaho's real history, not this imagined past of white cowboys taming Idaho land that so many people move here for. Um, there's a rich history here of immigrants and immigrants from all over working together, including indigenous people here long before us. There's this imaginary claim white men have on the Northwest that needs to be broken and that can be done with storytelling and sharing history. So uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. I know it's a heavy topic, but we're all in this together, but the fight has to continue for the generations after us. All right. Um... Thank you so much for that presentation, Alicia. It was very informative. Um, so for now, we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, if you are here in Zoom land, go ahead and pop that into the chat and I can read those. And then same here in the audience, 
If you have a question, raise your hand, and then I will repeat that for those folks joining us virtually. So first question. Anybody? Yes. Okay, so this question is if, Alicia, you can comment on the concept of white grievance and how that relates to Richard Butler. Ooh, white grievance. Did they have a, does, does the person who asked the question have a definition of white grievance? What is your definition? Uh, so this this audience member met Richard Butler while he was harboring Beam while he was a fugitive from justice. So, so um, working on this, uh, this man, when he interviewed Butler, Butler's son-in-law sat behind him and asked, why aren't you with us? Dot, dot, dot. Long story short, uh, there was a feeling that whites were not being equitably treated in California. Yes. Um, I, I, I wish I could have heard the whole comment, and I would love if that person would like to, to email me at some point. Um, I yes, would love to uh, we will to share <laughs> Alicia's, uh, we'll share Alicia's contact info. So yes. more in-depth things, you can contact her. So excuse yeah, my interruption. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that very briefly, um, just because there were a lot of, I don't know, there are just so, there's a lot of heightened tensions in California at the time, just like there still are. And with that second great migration of Black Americans into California, and not just Black Americans, but um, Mexican Americans, like, you know, the whole conglomerate of people were moving to California, um, there white people who had lived there their whole lives did feel like they were being left out of the conversation and their neighborhoods were being, you know, were changing in front of them. Um, their jobs were looking different. Everything felt different after World War II, which really led this um, flight out of California to go to spaces where people weren't migrating as much to like, like Idaho. Um, yeah, I hope that answers a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, we'll share her contact info. Yes, yeah. Um, it looks like in the chat we have somebody wondering about, well, sorry, there was a short comment and then we got a very long comment. Um, okay, they're wondering about this relationship between Christian nationalists and the effect that they're having on our current legislative session. And going along with that, I, I too have read articles equating Christian nationalism as quote unquote the new racism that it's similar organizations just basically using different language. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I haven't done 
a lot of research specifically on Christ Christian nationalists that exist right now, but it does feel a lot like Christian identity, which Richard Butler was all about. And there's always usually racial undertones to those. And so I'm not sure what to expect moving forward. Um, but when you are like, you know, hearing talks and speeches from these Christian nationalists uh, in the legislature, really paying attention to their language. And sometimes, you know, if you are a Christian or you grew up around Christianity, you can parse out what is real Christianity and what is this racist ideal of it um, and who is involved and who is included in their brand of, of uh, Christian nationalism. So I would just pay attention to language with that. Sure. Um, one here in the chat that I think we're all thinking is what are some of the things we can do as regular Idahoans to push back on this movement? Um, as I ended my presentation with, it's like, it's really, it's showing up. It's also knowing what is happening and going through the legislature right now. I know that there is a lot of things going through the House and the Senate that you can go to hearings of and you can be a voice for, but then also like really paying attention to those local elections. Um, that white nationalist was able to jump on a school board and post balls and he had only been in Idaho for like a year. And if somebody had done a little digging, he might not have been elected. Um, so just paying attention to what is happening in your neighborhood and locally and really like trying to do your research. And I know that's really exhausting, <laughs> but there's also some really great um, organizations in Idaho, like ACLU of Idaho, who is paying attention to these things and will give you um, detailed ways to vote if that is what you're really concerned with. So following the news, it's great. <laughs> sure. Um, another question on the chat is, you know, there's so much misinformation out there. How do we know that we are being educated and using correct sources for these things? Do you have any go-tos that you look for? Um, I, when I'm, when I'm trying to find information, sorry. Can you read that question again? Yeah. Um, uh, the, sorry, I'm reading through this very long chat message. Um, basically, how, what are ways that we can inform everyday Idahoans who maybe aren't as informed about this topic? What are some of the ways that you bring this up in conversation so that it's not a heated debate? Mm, I really wish I had an answer. And I know that everyone really struggles with that. I, and I think kind of just trying to push back on these like conspiracy theory views and really asking somebody why they might believe something without immediately telling them they're, that they're wrong and immediately telling them um, your point of view and, and what you know to be true, but really listening to them and figuring out like, what is the conspiracy theory they're talking about? What is that one piece that they're really holding on to and and kind of pressing them about it. Like, why do you really think that? Did you hear it once? Or is this something that, you know, like <laughs> I kind of just try to question in, a, in a, a compassionate way to really figure out why they might be thinking the way that they're thinking. Um, but then also like hosting events like these, I think are really important um, to be talking about it. So you can like take information with you and yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, um, well, do you see any difference between uh, the way both cases organize and the prevalence in the modern world? Yeah, so the question is about um, do you see any differences when you look at hate groups in North Idaho versus? Southern, you know, Treasure Valley, is it all one big network or do you see a difference between the two? 
Um, I don't see a difference between the two. I mean, North Idaho is a lot more politically active and publicly visible. Like they'll they'll walk around with their rifles and and be very um, open about it. They'll wear like logos and and um, patches on their jackets to make sure that you know because Northern Idaho is kind of just you know, it's very white and these groups have been up there for a long time. So they feel a little more emboldened to be publicly visible. And then in Southern Idaho, because I did, I grew up in Southern Idaho as well. It's much more quiet. There's like very quiet graffiti and acts of violence that where they aren't really tied to a group specifically. Um, but people in North Idaho will very specifically be a part of a militia and they like to show it so that's the only thing i can say okay yeah so, so the literature the, the church seems to be very important in the um analysis you did in the scribe do you have any sense of the literature uh so this question is that um it seems from your presentation that the church was very prevalent in the Aryan nations. Um, do you have any sense of what the liturgy was in the church? What the literature was? Liturgy? Liturgy, no. practices. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, no, well, the Christian identity really comes, I, I talk about it in my thesis, and I didn't really... Um, go back and study it before I prepared for this talk, but um, it's just a different interpret. They really, Christian identity uses a different interpretation of the Bible um, that was like in the 1910s in Europe, somebody had written this way of reading it where like white people were direct descendants of Adam and Eve, and then everything else is uh, spawns of Satan. So like they have this very specific view of um, this branch of separation almost. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure like their exact literature. I'd have to look it up. <laughs> I didn't do that before. I mean, I'm sure you could delve down some black holes in the internet to find that out, but I don't know if I'd want to do that. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yes. So I, th I think the question is related to employment and drug testing. Is that correct? Okay, so his question was, are we getting too many right-wing Christians in these agencies um, that are able to police some of this? That are able to police drug testing and... Are, are we getting right-wing people within our law enforcement that are, and the government? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people with um, right-wing ideology that do get elected into political um, spaces. Right now in Idaho, I would say a lot of our, like, Idaho legislature are currently Republicans, but are very, a lot of them have become more right wing as they, there's a lot of like lobbying groups it's like the Idaho Freedom Foundation that's very right wing um, that have put a lot of money and effort in lobbying the current legislature. So they've been like shaking hands with legislatures and 
trying to get um, approval for their bills that are passing. I can't say of any like specific sheriffs or police department people who are, um, you know, white supremacists or part of militia. I don't think they would openly say if they were. Um, yeah. Um, at this point, um, when we're done, I will give you her contact. And if you would like to contact her directly, that might be a better option. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yeah, in the corner. Okay. Um, so the question is, uh, so you mentioned, you know, after Trump was elected, we kind of saw um, a rise in these groups. And when he was not reelected, you know, the assumption may have been that they would die down, but they didn't. Um, do you see a reason as to why some of these groups have been emboldened since then? Yeah, um, Donald Trump was really the first president that very openly um, acknowledged white supremacist groups that were endorsing him. So when the Proud Boys, I would say like the Proud Boys and the, the alt-right, which was led by Richard Spencer, when they would show up to rallies, he was he would call them by their names. And there was that one um, very specific moment where he was talking in a speech when he's trying to get elected, where Proud Boys had been in the audience and he told them to stand down, but he acknowledged them. Um, and he didn't, he really enjoyed the attention because it did get him elected. So he never disavowed himself from the Ku Klux Klan who also endorsed him or the Proud Boys. So I think it was just that like finally being seen by a president and not, um, you know, being told that I, you can't endorse me, I don't want your endorsement. He wanted their endorsement. And so I think that's really emboldened a lot of people. And the fact that he's still active and, and the insurrection and him trying to be reelected has still, um, has just really kept their dream alive, I guess. All right, any more from the audience? Yes. of white supremacy organizations internationally? Okay, um, do we see these kinds of organizations internationally, not just here in Idaho? Is that your question? Okay, so do these local organizations reach out to other countries and do these other countries contact them and talk strategy? Um, there was some of it in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and there's also been some of it from specifically the UK. Um, they had a, a similar uprising of white nationalists and white separatist groups um in the uk at the same time that trump was elected so they would communicate and there was a time where some of those speakers from the uk would try to come to the us to talk and they would be uh they wouldn't be allowed to fly into the country um but a lot of the white separatist group in idaho specifically are really focused on creating this like white bastion in idaho oregon you you know Montana, Wyoming, and separating off from the United States government. So they're really focused inward and on the national scene. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
All right, last question. Any last thoughts? All right, well, I think I forgot to say this at the outset. My name is Haley Noble. I'm the executive director for the Lata County Historical Society. We are very grateful that Alicia was able to give us some of her time tonight. She did a wonderful job. Uh, we have Alicia's contact information. Um, we can send you her email if that's something you would like. Thank you so much for being here virtually in person. Thank you, Alicia. This was a wonderful event. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we did record this session, so if you would like a copy of the recording, please um, let us know. Uh, we had discussed being able to share it with those of us who attended, um, so if that's something you would like, please contact us. All right. Yes, yes, we will have that. So uh, thank you again for a thank wonderful you. evening.